Hi, welcome to Get Lit at the Walnut Creek Public Library. Get Lit gives uh, viewers a chance to meet local authors and find out about their writing process. My name is Pete Crooks. I'm senior editor and senior writer at Diablo Magazine. And we're here today with Romney Steele, an Oakland writer who has two fabulous books about food. Welcome, Romney. Thank you. Hi. How are you? Good. Good. It's nice to be here. So you have two beautiful food books. And I think food is one of those topics that you can't really uh, cover enough because you can drill into so many different mm. uh, types of food, food preparation, and the history of food. And your first book, My Nepenthe, mm -hmm. is a gorgeous uh, book that takes us through the history of a fascinating part of the California coast and your experience growing up there and how food was a huge part of the, of the culture. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about uh, your background and, and how that book came to be? Sure, sure. Um, I grew up in Big Sur, California. My grandparents, uh, Bill and Lolly Fassett, moved to Big Sur in um, the early 40s and opened the restaurant Nepenthe in uh, 49. And um, so that was, we were born and raised there. And as you know, the, the culture of Big Sur has been kind of very magical and also filled with, uh, you know, the, the New Age movement, the hippie movement, the kind of progressive movement. There's been a lot of movie stars in Hollywood there. And a lot of that kind of took place right at Nepenthe. We were kind of like in the nexus of it all. And um, so my grandparents, um, you know, were kind of our parents too. Our, our parents were very young and we were all kind of raised on the property and at Nepenthe in this kind of wild, <laughs> sometimes very unbridled is a, a word that I use, atmosphere. And food was always also a central theme in our lives. My grandmother spent some formative years on the island of Capri in Italy. And uh, food was a way in which she um, kind of shared who she was. And br bringing people together around the table was very important to her. And that, that kind of reflected in all that she did, not only at the restaurant, but in the family home, which was above the restaurant. And that meant the, the, the homeless person who was rambling through Big Sur in the 60s, they all came through and ended up at our family table. And to the famous writers and to Henry Miller and all these kinds of people, they all kind of gathered together. And so that's um, kind of what, what came about in my book as well and kind of the life that I grew up in, in which I wanted to kind of tell that story. I love Big Sur. I think yeah. it's just such a magically beautiful place. Um, and it still feels so <clears throat> sort of remote and unique and almost otherworldly in yes. its beauty. But um, in 1940, uh, there wasn't even like electricity running out there, was right. there? Right. No, we had to figure that out. My, my uncle, I kept saying, are you sure there was electricity or was there not electricity? No, there wasn't electricity when we moved. They moved to an old log cabin that was um, started by the Trails Club, and it was a place where people could come through and camp out if they needed to. So my grandparents bought that cabin from Rita Hayworth and Orson Welles. So there's a long, you know, kind of fun story about that. And um, electricity was just coming. It had come all the way to about where Post Ranch Inn is now today, and then it got extended later in the year for them. But no, there was no phones until the 60s, and, you know, there was, it was very wild. It was a very wild experience. And for as sort of untamed as that region was, it's so amazing that, you know, one of the great Hollywood royalty couples, Orson Welles and Rita Hayworth, have a connection to your story. Can you yes. talk a little bit about that? They weren't together for very long. Yeah, but they, they weren't together, were together, weren't together, were together, you know. And my grandfather was a great storyteller and used to love to tell all these kind of crazy stories about that. But they came through in the 40s on uh, gas rations during, you know, right around the war time. And the story was is that they came through and they had their agent of sorts, Hollywood agent with them, and they um, you know, landed at the cabin as a place to rest. So the cabin, if you've been to Nepenthe, there's this extraordinary view. So if you'd arrived there in the 40s, there's just a little cabin on top of a hill with that million dollar view, as my grandmother would say. And so they arrived and, and Rita went around and said, I want this house, and, you know, and they sent somebody out and about to, to find and buy this house. And there's lots of stories, and, you, and if you sit at Nepenthe, people ramble off in these stories, and we're like, wow, we've never heard that part of the story. And so you know, people kind of make things up. But um, evidently, they never even stayed the night. You know, they measured, measured for the curtains, and you know, she bought it. Um, and then they went through a divorce, and they got married again, and then they went through a divorce, and my grandparents um, ultimately bought it from Rita Hayworth, and we have the, the deed signed from her to my grandparents. So. That's amazing. Yeah. That's right around the time that they were making Lady from Shanghai, right, I believe, which right, was a right. spectacular yeah. uh, film noir that they did together. 
So um, growing up there, where did you go to the movies? Just how did you like? <laughs> we, we were the movies. You yeah. didn't have to go to the movies. We created movies on the terrace. And I, I say that literally and kind of jokingly, but it was very theatrical. Restaurants are theatrical. We grew up doing theater. And theater came to us. We had a lot of um, people that came and performed. My grandparents brought the Bach Festival there in the early days. Mm -hmm. um, they also set up films. We used to set up a sheet sometimes in the restaurant and watch films. Um, you know, there was no television until later on we had one, one black and white TV. So if you really wanted to go to a real movie, you had to drive to town. Which was <laughs> Which Carmel. Oh, okay. so it's a good hour away at yeah. least, right? Yeah. Well, um, you talked about Henry Miller visiting there, mm -hmm. and, and there were other great writers. Who did you read while you were growing up? What was oh and gosh. what was your interest I in? I knew that question was going to come. <laughs> well, you know, I never read Henry Miller until later in my life. And um, my second book, there's a little bit of a connection with Henry Miller because I was living in his house. Um, but uh, who did I read? Well, you know, my grandmother, my grandmother's library was wide and vast and uh, one of the, the the series of books that we actually grew up on was the wizard of oz the old we had like i don't know the, the 25 volume mm -hmm. um we grew up on that i wasn't as i i was not i would say your super literary reader because the there was just so much going on and um but i was a writer at a very early age of poetry and things like that you know so. And what did uh, what did you take from the writing experience as a young age? Why did you why were you drawn to that? Do you think it was a way to voice myself in a world where there were so many voices? I mean, there was so much going on, and people were you know, like I said, you were surrounded by either really famous people or people, very theatrical people, and it was kind of a way of carving out my own little corner. Mm -hmm. um, I got a lot of. Um, support from my, from, my, from my grandmother to do that. We were very much supported in the arts, each of us, in whatever ways we were, you know, manifesting that. So, um, yeah, it just, it allowed me to kind of be, do my own little thing, you know. And, and there was a lot of that around us. People were always writing, and somebody was writing, or somebody was doing a book, or somebody was doing a movie, even if they never made it anywhere. Mm. You know, there's a, it's a real creative force in Big Sur. That sounds yeah. wonderful. Yeah. And at, this, at the same time where it seemed like there was this busy world that you existed in with all these various strong individuals and, and people with a creative voice, yeah. you're also so far away from <clears throat> the bigger world. When did you get out and start to travel yeah. and see, the, <laughs> see the, the world at large? Yeah, there is an isolation that happens. Um, and it's funny because, again, not to, just to keep saying this, but we, we grew up with the sense that the world came to us. And, you know, my grandmother, I look back, and she had lived her formative years in Italy and um, in a way was well-traveled for a young woman of, born in the 19-teens. Um, and then my grandparents lived in San Francisco, and, and then they, you know, they lived in L.A. and, you know, and things like that in Hollywood. And my grandfather was born and raised in New York. But we were never... Um, sent out in the world like that, you know, interesting. My mom's generation was definitely not at all, or at least the women in the family weren't. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of came to it through my father. My father grew up in the South, so I, by a teenager, by the time I was a teenager, was started to go to the South to visit in the summers, and that was a huge, to go to Atlanta. I mean, it was like an eye-opener, you know, mm -hmm. it was just so different. And, um, and then later, when I was 16, I went to Europe for four months, and that was kind of a re my grandmother was kind of really wanted me to have the experience that she had. So um, she matched my funds, and, and I went with my stepmother, who was uh, European. And that was a big, you know, that was, phew, boom, that was, the, that was the window I needed. Wow. Yeah. And then you, you wrote articles. But what was your first published uh, story or article? That... Oh, gosh. Uh, hmm, that's my first. I think that's a good question. Okay, my first was when I was about 10. And it was um, a story about living on Partington, or going up to Partington Ridge, which is where Henry Miller lived. And I was visiting Harry Dick Ross, who is also written about in my book, and was a uh, local, uh, local artist, sculptor, and the neighbor and best friend of Henry Miller. And Henry writes about him as well. And he was a, just a lover of kids. And we, um, we would go up and visit him 
And I remember I wrote a story and he had it published and I don't remember where, so that was way back then. But in, later when I became a writer, it was probably about 12, 15 years ago. And well, you were in very good company right from the, right from the start. Now the first book that you published, My Nepenthe, is a gorgeous hardcover um, book that it, 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 it looks very nice on the coffee table. It's, it's great for the kitchen. And I, I was so interested to look through it because it not only has your personal family's history and narrative, mm. but the area that you grew up in and, and tells this rich story about Big Sur. And then it includes these wonderful recipes from the restaurant mm -hmm. and from the family tradition. And it, it puts the context of food in, in such a, an interesting um, volume. Uh, right. So how did, how did it, you realize Evolve. that this would be a great yeah. book and how did you get to the publishing yeah. stage? Well, you know, I've had these two, two lives always. You know, food was always the driver in my life. Um, as I said, I went to Europe and that was kind of a big eye opener with my stepmother's grandmother and living uh, in a little teeny funky little vineyard and learning how to, you know, go out and uh, kill a chicken and cook it right then. And, you know, all these kinds of things that I was surrounded with. So I was always doing food and working in food and we worked a very young age at the restaurant. Um, and then I had this other side where I wanted to be a writer and kind of be a woman of the world. And so I'd kind of go off and do one thing and then I'd always come back. And so um, when I moved up here, I came to go to Mills College and to get my writing degree. And it was um, then that I realized I had to find a way to marry those things and what better way than in a book, you mm -hmm. know? And so and you, so you put did. together a proposal for a publisher? And, yes. And, and, and what, what publisher did you go to? to uh... Uh, Andrews McMeal was the publisher that chose to, to do the book, mm -hmm. and they are in the Midwest. And um, but the publisher herself had been at Ten Speed for a very long time, so she knew and loved Big Sur and Nepenthe, and thought it would be a great um, project. And they were wonderful in the sense that all the things that you've talked about the book, those are not typically they don't typically get to happen in books. And I got to kind of direct. The, the book and work on the visuals and work with the photographer that I wanted and even you know bring in my own designer and work with her on that so it was um, a creative project in all you know all forms yeah. and for a first book that must have been very satisfying to get to have so much um, final say on on yeah. how it's going to look and 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 putting it together now this book is such a personal project for you yes it's your entire life it's your yeah. family's history and it's this document of this very special place that you grew up. Yeah. What was your reaction? I, I think of the Meryl Streep movie where she was Julia Child and the, and the cookbook comes for the first time and she pulls it out uh, yeah. in the last scene. What was your reaction when you saw this book yeah. in its I printed mean, form? Yeah. Well, it's funny because my, my daughter was home and evidently the book arrived and she opened it up and started taking photos of herself with a book and putting it all over Facebook. And I, I don't know where I was, but somehow the picture came through. You saw your book <laughs> I was on like, Facebook. I That's saw it. my book through her. <laughs> and um, so, you know, it was, it was overwhelming. I live in a little small place with my kids, and they were both in high school. And it was, it was an overwhelming experience. And yet, I think I mentioned to you earlier, it was a little, it's a little uh, deflating. You kind of like, you worked your tail off. And it was a very emotional project. And I had to do a lot of research and go back to the family. And I didn't, um, you know, it's, it's financially, it's actually straining to write a book. So um, it was almost like, now what? You know, it's like it's out there in print, and then your whole life is suddenly out there to some to some level, and then you know. But it has a life of its own, and it, it and it goes on, and you and you work with it. So it was very, you know, it was very wonderful, but it was also a little like ah. It, there it is. It's, yeah. You know, what do it, you do now? It, again, I, I I think it's such a gorgeous book, and in this day of digital content where mm -hmm. people are grabbing recipes off mm -hmm. websites and. And, and ripping them off blogs, it's nice to see something so tangible mm -hmm. uh, and for, for food lovers especially. Now, that must have been a pretty satisfying experience, having the book in print and going to events like Walnut Creek uh, Authors Under the Stars here at the library, where you can talk with the people that have read your book and have used the recipes. Yes. Can you talk about that feedback you've gotten from readers? Sure. I mean, that's the best part is, you know, going to a bookstore, and I've had a lot of bookstores be very supportive. And, you know, you get up and you talk and you tell your story. But there's nothing like an event where food is involved. Because that, 
you know, food is just this wonderful way of bridging so many stories, mm -hmm. lives, and cultures. And, and food is really, you know, it tells a culture. And, um, you know, our Nepenthe and Big Sur was a particular culture within California. And we grew up and it was a very unique setting and a very unique environment. So um, I love that when I can share food and share around a table or I can bring something that's part of the book. It also makes the books come alive in a way, as you say, in this world where there's so much digital content and everybody's, you know, running around grabbing things off the internet, that there's no real life behind a lot of those recipes. <clears throat> you know, and for me, I don't use recipes that often, but I love the story behind a recipe, and that's what's really meaningful for me. So I hope that people get that in my books as well, that they really get a sense of who we were, what I love, and how to share that. And so I've had really great feedback, especially on those kinds of shared food and story events. Now, when you said you, it, there's something deflating about seeing all that work and it being done, it's this, <clears throat> this little touchstone in your life that it's time to move on to the next project, mm -hmm. uh, which for you was Plum Gorgeous, a, yes. a, another beautiful food book. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk about um, how you moved into that project yeah, and how sure. Plum Gorgeous came to be? Well, you know, uh, as glamorous as it sounds with authors, I think, um, you know, everybody's scrambling, and, and writing books is, it's not like the most lucrative business in the world. And I was trying to kind of, you know, turn back to what I really wanted to do, which was to write. <clears throat> and, you know, pitching stories and all these kinds of things, which are really demanding, and it's hard to keep up. And I just, I kind of went back again inside and just went, you know, there's, a, there's another book that's been, a, been there for a long time. And um, so when I, I was able to pitch that again, and they were like, yes, let's do it. And this book actually is, for me, is more, I, I love my first book, but this book is a particularly personal for me. And it kind of captures a particular year in my life that was very meaningful. And it's a little bit more of who I am today as well. And so I, I really love that part of it. And it's also very visual. Um, and it tells a story of living in a Big Sur orchard for a year, and, um, and actually two orchards. And, and one of those properties was Henry Miller's house that I lived at with my kids for a year. And so I weave in that book not only a poetic story and journey with my children when they were really young, but also, also a literary story. It was really, it was the moment that I said I want to be a writer and I have to get off this mountain and get out of Big Sur. So that, there is a moment in the book where I have um, poetry and writings that were important to me over my life and those also come into the book. So it's a very, for me, it's a very special book and it's also beautiful food. <laughs> right, so it's, it's accessible to everybody, yeah. but you get to yeah. share a yeah. very personal story. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you studied writing at Mills College, mm -hmm. which has an outstanding writing program. Mm -hmm. uh, Mills College is in Oakland and uh, at Diablo Magazine, we're always looking for stories about the East Bay. Oh, okay. So given that you came from this spectacular, beautiful place that must have felt so unique and special to grow up, uh, now you're an East Bay resident, so yeah. like, can you talk a bit about the East Bay as a, as a place to live and as yeah. a community for, for sure. writers and creative people? Well, I, I love living in Oakland, and two things. It reminded me when I moved up here a little bit of Atlanta, Georgia, which was for, formative for me as a you know, young teenager going from Big Sur to that experience. Um, <clears throat> and so I, there was a connection in that way that I loved, kind of the urban lifestyle, really mixed cultures and stuff. But... Um, as a writer in an artistic community, yeah, one of the first events I went to was off um, the UC campus, and it was women writers. And, I, and I, they were all women in their late 40s and 50s, and I thought, I want to be one of those women one day. And that was a real, it was very inspirational for me to be, feel like I had access to people like that. And so Mills was a great, um, Mills was a great, uh, you know, medium to, to arrive at. I mean, coming from Big Sur and then you know, landing in Oakland was a little, I was a little uncertain of what that looked like. So we had 80 acres of land for four years that my kids ran around on, mm -hmm. which was Mills, you know, and so I'm grateful for that experience. And I always like to ask <coughs> about public libraries. I grew up loving the, the old Walnut <coughs> Creek Public Library. I've traveled abroad and had, um, used the Sydney Public Library mm -hmm. and, and libraries all over the world uh, have always been a great place to 
to rest, to mm -hmm. read, and to, to have access to these wonderful resources. Yeah. Was there a library in Big Sur growing up? Well, there was, and um, an unusual library. It was um, in a woman's house, and her name was Kay Short, and um, it was on a property that was above Nepenthe through the canyon, so we would kind of go below our family's restaurant, climb through the canyon, and then up a trail, and then we could land at Kay's house. And she had certain hours, and she had this big, beautiful room, I just remember, with a wall, you know, floor-to-ceiling wall of books. And that was the first library in Big Sur, and that must have been in the early 70s. Um, and then later, there was um, a small library that was posted near Ripplewood, and it's still there today. And I just got to go back there this year and talk. And it was really, um, I have to say, it was one of the more special experiences to kind of go back to the first library that we had, that I grew up with, and um, be able to speak there and share my personal story amongst big Surians, kind of. So, Great yeah. Great full circle journey. Yeah, and I've always used the Oakland Library in my neighborhood. And that was recently threatened to, to not be there, and it suddenly really made me aware. Um, and the Oakland uh, Library downtown is just beautiful. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, we're so. very, very lucky in this area to have such an investment in, in public libraries. Yes. And isn't there a, a library in Big Sur that uh, also hosts music concerts? Yeah, Henry Miller Library. Yeah, the Henry mm -hmm. Miller Library. And I've, yes. seen, I've noticed, I've never been to a show there, but I've noticed that Lucinda Williams is playing there. Oh, and I always yeah. think, oh, what a great place to go for a little road trip and see. Yeah. Uh, see Magnus, artists. who runs the library, um, has a, is a great internationalist, and he brings some amazing people there. And um, yes, that houses a lot of Henry Miller's books. That property was owned um, by Emil White, who was also a, a best friend to Henry and gave his property over to the library when he died. Um, also has my book in there and local authors. And um, yeah, it's a real local, wonderful local place. In a lot of ways, it reminds me of what Nepenthe used to do in the 50s and 60s, you know. Um, so it's kind of created a new environment for that, which is really wonderful. Yeah. I'm always interested, too, in, in writers, how much time do you uh, set aside to read? We're so busy these days, and I find that I really have to make time to read, and sometimes I'll make sure to take BART instead of driving yeah. to oh, the city yeah. to make sure I have some time to read a book. Mm -hmm. how, how about you? Do you find that you have to kind of like budget that time now? I'm actually doing more reading than I'm doing writing oh, well, that's not <laughs> right bad. now in some ways. So, um, but yes, you know, you, you do. Um, I'm working on so many, I'm working not only on writing, but I'm working on a food project and a, and a cafe in Oakland. And so reading has become the place where I'm just kind of curling up on the couch right now and, and finding my little pockets, you know, getting in the bath. I've been doing, a, I've been doing it a lot lately, which That's has good. been really wonderful. And I've just read a fabulous book. So What did you just read? I just read a book called The Warmth of Other Suns. And I, it is the most, just a beautiful story about the great black migration. Um, and it's so beautifully written, and it was like 500 pages, and I just learned so much about the history of the South and the coming to the West, and um, it was just a very, it's just a really fabulous book. That sounds It's very great. worth reading. And yeah. um, how do you, sh have you shared libraries or reading with your kids, and especially this mm -hmm. idea of, of, of food writing, um, yeah. how is that shared in the, in the family? Well, my son was, is the biggest reader, you know, and um, w would just lock himself in the room for, you know, <laughs> as teenage boys can do, mm -hmm. you know, for days and hours, and, and you go, get out of there while well, I'm reading. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, so, and libraries were always a big source for us, um, especially during that time period. Now he's, you know, 21 and buys books, I, I think. Um, and that's part of you know, we give each other books. At, it's funny, you know, I, I do a lot of book giving to my kids. We were always given books, and that was real important to my grandparents. Um, my son seems to give me big, beautiful food books, and my daughter as well, um, as part of their gifts to me. So that's, that's really fun. Um, and shared food books. Uh, my daughter, I give her cookbooks now. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Do you, do you so, read on an iPad at all? I don't. I'm yeah. finding more and more. I, I interviewed the uh, tennis player Martina Navratilova, oh, how and she fun. she told me I'm one of those people that would thought I would never stop reading books, but 
but I can keep 25 books on an iPad and she has to fly across the pond yes. so often that yeah. that can be a great um, resource. I would think too for, for food, digital publishing actually has some benefits because you yes. can show video of, yes. of food preparation, but there's still something about yes. a book and, that is so. And both my books now are on, um, were digitized for that format, and I have to be honest, I have not <laughs> gone back and seen how it actually comes out. Mm -hmm. I have an iPad, so I'm gonna do that. Um, and my son reads on a Kindle all the time. It's, it's interesting, you know, yeah. he's constantly got that on. So. I was talking to an author recently who said he's been asked to sign more Kindles than copies of books. Oh, how funny. Lately. So it's, oh, a, it's, an, it's a brave, an brave new world yeah, that we're in. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, yeah. um, thank you so much for coming oh. to Walnut Creek and yes. for sharing your stories uh, about your writing and your life. It's such an interesting um, series of books that you've published. Uh, good luck on the next project thank that you. you're working on. Yeah, thank and you. And thanks so much for coming to Walnut Creek. Thanks to uh, Romney Steele for sharing her stories on Get Lit. Make sure to tune in to Get Lit regularly and you'll meet all kinds of local authors, hear their stories uh, here at the Walnut Creek Public Library. Thank you for watching.